Hi everyone, it's Kim. Welcome back to my channel, Evlady. Today I wanted to share my guide and tips and tricks on how to write a research paper. I am an incoming fourth year PhD student in epidemiology, so I have submitted my fair share of papers to peer-reviewed journals. I've had some papers accepted and published. I've also had papers that are currently under review and I'm currently working on a revise and resubmit. I've also been a peer reviewer for journals after I published my first paper. I started getting more emails asking me to be a reviewer. So this guideline is still a work in progress because I am still an epidemiologist in training, but I do feel like I have a few tips and tricks to share from my journey along the way. I feel like these tips would be applicable to anyone who's trying to write a research paper for um, your advisor, your thesis, your dissertation. If you are um, collecting or analyzing administrative data sets, and particularly if you are in the health sciences and um, epidemiology like me, but I've also submitted to more social science journals as well, like prevention science journals and psychological journals. So any paper that needs an intro methods results discussion section, hopefully this will be helpful for you. So I'm going to go in order of how you might read a paper, but I will let you know anywhere that I deviate from this when writing. So the introduction is where you really highlight the significance of your research question and discuss the background. So I tend to start this kind of like a, like drilling in starting really broad and then going very narrow. So your first paragraph typically is where you state the scope of the problem. In epidemiology, we often start by how many people experience this disease or outcome, um, like morbidity and mortality numbers or prevalences. Um, you can also talk about how much the disease or outcome costs the healthcare system or the economic system, the impact that whatever outcome you are studying or exposure you're studying has on people's physical health, um, their mental health, the health of communities. And so that's the pretty like broad way to start. And then you go into the next section, which would be the prior literature. So you want your research question to be grounded in what the scientific body has talked about. You don't want to come out of nowhere like, oh, I'm going to study the connection between these two things that have shown no relationship. So you want to discuss what prior literature has found. And if you are studying something that is a little bit more different and hasn't been looked at before, you can have a couple of paragraphs and then try to bridge those together, describing maybe like the exposure and the outcome that you have, but that haven't been looked at together. The introduction takes the longest, but I wouldn't say it's the hardest to do, but reading all of that prior literature, synthesizing it, using your own words, having the relevant cited um, literature, you want to make sure to have some really like make sure you've read like the seminal work, but also whenever I'm reviewing, I want to make sure that someone is also looking at recent literature because our scientific advancements have really changed and the things that we know to include in our models have changed. So I want to see that as a reviewer. So it's something to consider when you are writing this paragraph of your introduction. After you've established what the prior literature has found, now you want to establish what the gaps are or our remaining questions. If the prior literature was sufficient, you wouldn't be doing your research project or wouldn't really need to publish it, right? So you need to show where we still have remaining questions. This can be, oh, we've like found prior literature has shown this in adults, but we don't know how this connection between adolescents, or we know this from urban literature, but we don't know it in rural areas. You might also see that like the prior literature hasn't taken into account an important confounder, hasn't considered um, social determinants of health, and so that can be where there's remaining questions. This it can also be something where the remaining question is like our methodological understanding or our analysis has changed from the past, so maybe there is a new advancement in how we analyze data, maybe like spatial analysis, oh like this the prior work hasn't considered um, the spatial dependence between these variables. And so 
that is a significant gap because now we are able to look at that and we weren't in the past and that could actually really change what we know about the prior literature. So that's how you establish your the significance of your work and your background. And so then that finally, after you've now said like what the gaps are, which you also want to be pretty diplomatic about as well. You don't want to just say like, oh, the prior research is bad and my research is good. You want to kind of showcase how you will add to the literature, but without kind of just saying like, oh, everything else is bad. And that leads you to your current study. And this I usually do even have a separate subheading that says current study. Here's where you'll be saying what your research question is, what you hypothesize, and maybe like a slight bit of your approach. So because of these remaining gaps and the importance of this problem, I will be uh, studying this connection using this data set in this years, or I will be looking at this, the connection between this exposure and this outcome for this group in this area. And so you briefly then say like your research questions and your hypothesis. And then that is your introduction. So next is your method section. And this is usually the section that I start writing first because it's basically your plan. And so it is probably what you've talked to your advisor about this and the current study, because you know what you're going to be analyzing and you've probably discussed how you're going to do that. And so the methods is the approach to answer your research question. So here I focus on data sources. So what data am I using describing when, where, how it was collected, if it is something that is um, publicly available or has been used extensively in research, you can find pretty good examples of how to describe this data source from other papers that you're reading, even if they're not looking at your research question, if they used your data source. Next, you want to discuss the measures. So what specific, if it's like a survey, what survey question are you using to measure your exposure? What survey question are you using for your outcome? This also kind of goes back to data sources. If you're linking any data sources, survey responses and like connecting that to death record data or um, program data or something, you want to make sure you mention all of your sources. And then the measures is where you define your exposure, your outcome and your covariates. So your survey question, if you're using a survey, how are you measuring your exposure? If the survey question had a lot of different response options, but you're dichotomizing it to yes, this person ever experienced this or no, you would want to say like, I categorized it this way, even if someone was able to choose, oh, like zero, one or two times, three to four times. You'll also want to do this for your outcome and your covariates. So covariates include your confounders, things you're controlling for in the model, um, things that you're considering as effect modifiers, if you're doing any stratification. And you would also want to describe those in the same way. How are you classifying age? Are you going to leave it continuous? Are you, do you have categories? Are they five year bands, 10 year bands? And for that section, I think you can be a little briefer. You don't have to describe as detailed as your exposure and your outcome, but you do want to list what covariates you're considering. If you're doing like a multi-level model that has community level factors, family level factors, individual level factors, you might also want to have sections organized that way. And so you want the reader to be pretty clear of what it is that you're measuring. What does it mean to be, to have the outcome so that when they're in the results, they know clearly what you have done. And so after measures, I'll typically have like my statistical analysis section. And this is where you describe which model you're running, whether it's like a logistic regression, which will give you odds ratios, a Poisson regression, a linear regression, a lot of regressions. And this is where you describe um, also what you'll be doing with missing data. You can, if you're doing something that is like more mathematically complicated, you might even include your written mathematical model if that makes it easier for the reader to understand. And you'll want to say which software you're using. If you're using like a, like a newer analysis technique, you might also want to include like which package, like if you're using R and there's a, a specific library that you'll be using, you'll want to include that. A lot of times when you're learning how to write research papers, your professors will say like, oh, the method section should be so detailed that someone else could replicate your study. And I find that to be a little misleading and that if you read a lot of papers, 
you'll notice like you really couldn't with that information, especially the statistical analysis section. People will just say, oh, we ran a logistic regression and included covariates. And you're like, but how did you include the covariates? Like which stage, which type of model? Like there's a lot like of details that are not included. So a good idea for this is even if prior research hasn't looked at your specific exposure and outcome, you can look at examples that have used your type of statistical analysis to see which level of detail they get into. You can also start it being pretty specific um, and then removing things later if it seems like that other papers don't go that in depth. If you have a very advanced statistical analysis technique, you might also put some things in the appendix, add in at the end if you're or that your study was approved by the IRB, even if it was something exempt, you still wanna clearly state that that protocol was approved. Some exceptions to this, my like plan here about the methods section is if you are recruiting participants, you'll want to include details about how you recruited and like where the sample is from and like recruitment protocols, which might be more extensive than like a data source section. So you'll definitely want to include that as well. And that's where also your IRB would be really important if you are consenting uh, participants. And now we are to the results section. In this section, you will have to write after you've done your analysis, of course. And one tip I have here is to start with your tables and figures. You've probably been making those to discuss project with your advisor and the co-authors and your peers about like what results you're seeing. And I think that's a really good way to start the writing process for the results section is to have the tables and figures that you want to include in the paper because any information that you write in the text should be in the table and anything in the table should be in the text. And in general, I structure my results with first my descriptive findings. So in Epi, we talk about like table one, which is your exposure status. So did someone, was they, were they exposed or not exposed? And then all of like the socio-demographic information that you have, and that's like your table one, just to show like, are these two exposure groups really different from each other. This also helps you decide like what are confounders that you want to adjust for if the groups are just so different on this one aspect that could bias your the association you've made with the exposure and the outcome. So I typically just start with the descriptive findings. So like we found people that were exposed to this factor were more likely to be in this age range or have this income bracket or live in this region or things like that. Next, you'll go into your inferential results. So this would be discussing your like regression results. So you'll want to include your 95% confidence intervals, your p-values, that information. The big thing in the results section is to keep it kind of, I guess, on the boring side of just writing what you observed. We found the association between x and y was this. The uh, odds ratio was 2.0, 95% confidence interval 1.5 to 2.5 p-value this. And you wanna keep it pretty straightforward that way. And so now for the final part of the paper, the discussion, and I think I typically hear this is like the hardest part to write because you're distilling all of that information and you're also kind of adding your interpretation to it. And I find a lot of Grad students can find this a little tricky to do because you do want to highlight the importance of your work and we can be pretty like self-conscious about that. And so the discussion, I think of it as trying to include a few different sections and that helps me keep organized. Your first paragraph is really just to restate your results without the numbers or like with a very broad number is we found that this exposure generally leads to experiencing this outcome or you're more likely to experience this outcome that way. Something that's a little bit more digestible than all of your nuanced results. And so you want to restate what you found. What's that takeaway? Then you want to go into why you think you found this. And this is where you are being a little bit more interpretive, but it should really be backed by prior research and should not be too like overstated. But here are some things that why you think you found this. It should be based on something, but this is why, like what mechanisms do you think are causing that? Why is it a reasonable result that you, why is the result that you found reasonable? Whether that's a null finding or you failed to reject the null, we want to kind of see your reasoning for why you think that um, you found the results that you found. 
And that kind of ties into the next point you should make sure is in your discussion is you should tie this back to prior literature. Is what you found similar to prior literature? In that case, you can say like, oh, you know, this supports what we found, like what this study found and this study found, but we were able to like expand it to this group. Or is, are your results very different than prior literature? And you'll really want to address that clearly because a, a reviewer, if your results are totally different than the whole prior body of work. We want to know why you think that that's something reasonable or if it's just like an artifact of your data or was there something really wrong with your analysis plan? Um, so we really want to know if you're finding different results, why do you think that and have research that maybe is not like the same, but then like can kind of bridge of why we think this is different. Did the prior studies not include certain like really important social determinants of health? And you did. And that's why you think there are different results. Next, you want to say the limitations of your study. And this is where I think it's like the easiest part to write is the limitations because like I said, grad students, we tend to be pretty like hypercritical of our work and we can point out like all of the flaws in the method. Um, and so you want this to be include like all your major limitations, but you don't want it to be, oh, just like nitpicking every part of your study. Some main things to think of is like the data source. Are there any known limitations with the data source that you used? Is there any uh, possible selection bias in your protocol or in just even surveys? Who decides to participate? Is there any social desirability bias of if you're asking sensitive questions? Could there be any misclassification in your exposure or outcome? Are there any people that are not included? Generalizability. Who does your study apply to and who would it not? Um, this is something you definitely want to consider and adding to probably all your limitation section because research really shouldn't broadly apply to everyone. There should be ways that you can say like, this is, we found this finding in this context and you know there is potential limitations that we might not find this in other contexts because that shows that you are really thoughtful about um, what you really studied. The last kind of paragraph or section is, well I guess it's the second to last would be any future research ideas or future implications of your work. So this can stem from your limitations. So oh we weren't able to or we think we like weren't able to reach this certain group with our um, survey. So future research should examine this, this exposure and outcome in this group. Or um, one limitation is that we didn't have like historical data or uh, we don't have like recent years and there might be something that really would make a difference. Now it should be lim like um, the limitations in the future research should be things that you couldn't have done with your data source. So if you did have that variable, that you said like, oh, it's a limitation I don't have, um, I didn't include socioeconomic status, but your data source does have that, that would be something you could have just done in your um, analysis. So it should be things that you can say like, oh, this data is not included in this data source, but would be an important factor to consider for future research. Or future research can um, talk about like the mechanisms. So you stated why you think you found this association, but future research could specifically try to understand like maybe through like a mediation analysis of how this exposure impacts this outcome. You also might want to include like implications. So what does this mean? If this is true, and of course your one project is not the end all be all for the whole state of the literature, but if how this might impact practice, policy, programs, and say some examples of how this information can be used for prevention efforts, intervention efforts, is really helpful to include and of course like there don't overstate like oh because we found this it means that we can stop all um, deaths due to this or we can reduce healthcare costs by billions of dollars like you want to stay pretty grounded in what you found but I do think it's important to have that future implications section and then your last paragraph in the discussion is typically a conclusion that kind of summarizes your main finding the approach that you use to find that and um, what that means for the research, do we understand something new, or for like practice policy, like should now we um, consider this when making intervention programs. So for your references, just use a citation manager, <laughs> make sure you have one, it can be um, any one that you like, but see if it has a plugin for Word. So I use Zotero, I know a lot of people in health sciences use Mendeley or EndNote. I find I like Zotero, and 
since I am in health sciences, a lot of reference sections are in American Medical Association, which is numbered. And so if you're revising and editing and moving things around for flow, your number of your sources might change quite a bit. And so it's so helpful to have the plugin so that you don't have to keep manually changing things. Also, if you then end up submitting to maybe a journal that uses the American Psychological Association, you can easily change your formatting if you're using a citation manager rather than having to do that by hand. And so now for some of my overall tips that didn't really apply to any specific section. One, feel free to start with an outline. I find that the easiest where I'll just paste different notes and things from like other papers. Just remember if you're doing that not to accidentally plagiarize. Starting with an outline is good. Again, like I said, you can go in any order when you're writing. I typically start with the last paragraph of the intro, the current study section, because that's my research question, and my methods, because that's how I'll be doing the research. And then I usually leave the discussion for the end, because that's, and sometimes I'll even send that to my um, advisor or co-authors in an outline form to make sure everyone agrees with what the results are saying, like what are our implications and what framing we should do. So that's another tip that you could do is before writing a whole discussion and then finding that your co-authors don't really necessarily agree with that direction of the paper is to leave that in an outline form and then discuss. You should also consider what journals you're planning on submitting to. And one way to think of this is what journals are you citing a lot from your introduction section. You can also use a website called Jane, which gives you different using keywords or like a draft abstract, um, which journals like match those. So that's a really good resource. And then look at that journal's submission page to make sure that you are meeting the word count the or page limit and have the right section. So most will have the headings that I discuss, but some might ask for additional subheadings. That'll also let you know which reference style to use. But again, if you use a citation manager, you can easily switch that. Uh, another final tip is that most public well, all publications will ask for an abstract. Uh, so the abstract length can really differ by journals. So I tend to do that at the end. Also, it's I want to hear my co-author's thoughts on the framing for the introduction and the discussion before I commit to the abstract, which has to be the mo most synthesized. And also I'll ask them like, which results should I highlight in the abstract? So I think it's probably definitely okay um, to do the abstract at the very end. I usually send a whole paper to the co-authors, get their feedback, and then I'll send that next draft with a draft abstract. So those are all my tips and my guide to writing a research paper to submit to a peer-reviewed journal. Please let me know any tips that you have down below or any tips that you really liked from this video. And good luck writing and analyzing your data and good luck with submitting. And I will see you next time. Bye.